So now I'm going to turn it over to our superintendent of schools. He's going to provide more information about the bond election. We're so excited to learn more about this. The chamber strongly supports the objective of this bond package, and we learn more. We look forward to really learning more about this. Well, while we're expressing uh, thank yous, I, I, I too, I want to thank the chamber for this opportunity. I uh, do want to thank everybody for being here this morning and, and for Baylor Scott White. Uh, see, I got it right. Um, <laughs> for hosting us. Um, you know, I really want to accomplish a couple things this morning. First of all, absolutely. I want to make sure that everybody leaves here with, with information related to this bond package. Um, but secondarily, I, you know, I, I want you to be proud of what we do for the children of this community. And uh, I, I think I can accomplish both of those things. Um, along with that second concept, if you didn't grab one of these, we like to give these out like candy. Uh, there are a couple sheets of, of paper out there in the front. One speaks to some of the achievements that, that our kids have had. The other speaks to some of our efficiencies and our priorities in the way we are funding. So we're, um, you know, I won't be covering a lot of what's in those sheets, but we think they do uh, kind of add to that notion that, that we want you to be proud of what we do. Uh, just a little point of fact, as we go through this, you'll see some pictures. They're not stock photos. They are our kids and our teachers in action. Uh, in fact, that's my student advisory group. I told them, they come from all of our senior high schools and our academy, I told them they were going to actually have a real true advisory role. We were going to give them some problems that we truly wrestle with. And rest assured, they took that and ran with it. So they are more than glad to give me uh, advice. Uh, that, that's David Yu, actually Broadcom master, one of the best middle school researchers in America. They named 30 of those. Uh, in America. We had two of them, by the way. Texas had three. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little later on. So um, just a little budget 101, if you will. We really, uh, school districts have two budgets, if you will, and, and one of them is the one we think of most, and that's the operating fund. And, and that's because that's what really is dealing with programs and salaries and everything that we normally equate with uh, you know, the delivery of service. But we do have a capital budget. Now, I call it capital budget. Most of the world calls it capital budget. Um, in Texas, it's called debt services fund because the way you fund those things, buses, technology, infrastructure, renewal, any new capacity, all of those things that are capital uh, assets, renovations, you fund those through bonds. That's the way Texas school funding works. So that's what we're going to be talking about, primarily that piece of the budget this morning. So um, before we go into it, though, just a little bit of a profile about us. Um, you know, you look at the bottom right there. We are a very diverse district. We, we're proud of that. We think it adds a lot of value uh, to the 55,000 students that we serve. Um, kind of proud of this up in the upper corner. We, uh, we are great because we have great teachers. They, they are... Uh, over a third of them have advanced degrees. We have a turnover rate that's less than the state and national average. Um, they, uh, we have a, a class size that's, that's great. Uh, our teachers average a little more experience than in the state of Texas. So um, we're really proud of that group of folks. Um, so uh, before we get on, let's talk about some, some of the things that you do see on those two sheets. First of all, if you look at our ACT, SAT, um, if you're in the economic development world, I always point out, make sure you find out how many kids took that test. Our kids, uh, we have more participate on the SAT by a lot than the national average, and yet we outperform the national average and the state average by quite a bit. ACT, we have more test takers as well, not by quite as big a margin, but we do have more. And so when you, when you look at that and see our kids' performance, know that it's not because we only put 10% out there. We actually have more kids taking those tests than the, than the state average by a lot. Uh, we are on the AP Honor Roll, uh, 425 districts in North America, really U.S. and Canada, that, that the College Board identifies for the kids' performance on AP uh, testing. Really proud of that one. I'm, I'm a science and engineering fair geek. I don't know why. I, I wasn't that when I was in, in school. Um, but we are a science and research juggernaut. Uh, we are the unrivaled leader in the, in the state of Texas. And when I say that, um, if you look over the last three years, uh, our kids have won 
over half of the first place awards in the state science and engineering fair and there are 1200 some districts in Texas so it means Plano kids go down there and take over half the first place awards and the other 1200 districts wrestle for the other half. Um, that, that is a pretty accomplished feat. In fact, um, I'm going to get on three buses at 5.30 tomorrow morning because we're sending more kids than we ever have down there uh, because of their regional competition winners. And I'm going to get on the bus at 5.30 in the morning and tell them that they carry on a rich tradition of excellence and that we are very proud of them. And then I'll tell them if we're going to go down there anyway, we might as well win a few of these things. So, um, which I believe that they will. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, you know, we're, uh, I, I think, in germane to this audience, uh, I believe that Plano ISD helps us be an economic development engine. You know, I put that quote up there from uh, Jim Lentz, the CEO of Toyota, and, I, and we put it up there because he didn't make it here in Plano. He said it in Detroit, Michigan. So, um, you know, we think that's pretty important that, that um, that's the quote that he chose to, to share people about why, why relocate into Plano. And... Uh, and you see some of the other uh, comments, and it is truly a big deal in economic development, um, the, the opportunities that kids have in the public schools. So with that in mind, let's, let's talk uh, about uh, this bond proposal. First, let's talk about how we kind of got there. Um, first of all, the last bond, it's, it was eight years ago, and uh, that was 2008. It was supposed to be a four-year bond, but we all know kind of what happened in the economic uh, you know, world. And, and so that four-year bond stretched out to eight years. Um, you know, we kept making sure that we were, were dealing with critical infrastructure, chillers, roofs, but there were certain things that probably we paid a price for that, particularly technology. But um, so that's really the longest time, I think, Steve. Uh, by the way, Steve Fortenberry, our CFO, is here, and he's here to make sure my numbers don't go wacky. And, and, uh, um, <laughs> But, but it's 1951, I think, is the last time we went eight years uh, with, without a bond uh, proposal in Plano ISD. Um, so um, this, the, the last thing before I go into the, the committee work, uh, Plano does carry a AAA bond rating. It, it, is, it is about as high, when you, Steve, when you say as you, high as you can get for, for really public schools. And uh, we pulled that quote out of there and, and you know, Moody's doesn't know Plano ISD from any other ISD. What they care about is, do you, are you responsible in the way you do your, your financial work? And uh, they basically said uh, that, that we are, and in fact, uh, in general, make tough decisions when they have plenty of examples of people who don't. And um, so we are in a good position because of really good uh, financial decisions that have ma been made for, for several years. So with that in mind, um, we did bring together 29 uh, interesting community members, and I say interesting, we, we purposely grabbed people east to west, young, old, some have kids, some didn't. We had teacher leaders in there, we had a couple principals. Um, I would say we had every kind of ideological bent in the room, if you will, and, and that was very purposeful. And we wanted some gnashing of teeth, and we got that. Uh, for five months. In fact, those meetings went on what seemed to be 24 hours, but they, they were long. Um, but, and, and this is, in fact, the makeup uh, of some of the, the folks that, that were on that committee. Um, and, and quite honestly, their, their task was to really understand <coughs> what are the facilities needs, what are the, the um, academic needs that can be assisted through facilities and through other capital things, but also understand and be responsible to our taxpaying citizens. And also, we, we said, let's look down the line and say, we want to know that five years when this bond package is over, have we put the organization and the community in a position to continue being successful. And those were really the drivers of their work. Um, and so this is what emerged from that. And, and uh, so I'm going to walk through the categories of the bond projects. And you, if on one of the sheets that you have out front, you'll see it has the little wheel that explains all of this. And they go from the largest to the smallest. So, and by the way, at the end, I will take questions at the end. But if you, if you have one of them during the presentation, that's all fine too. So um, let's start with this. Um, 
First of all, this is the biggest category because this is your classic renovation infrastructure renewal. When you look at this 64, $65 million systems and maintenance, I mean, you know, we don't put on magic roofs. They need to be replaced. Our chillers will fail. And when they do, uh, you know, no customer expects, well, get to it when you can. When the air conditioning goes down, I'm a courtesy call on the way to the governor. So rest assured, they want to know the chiller is replaced tomorrow. Um, so um, that's why, I mean, obviously that is the, the biggest piece of that uh, category. But another big chunk, uh, Plano ISD for many years has been um, just committed to making sure that we will not let facilities get not only in disrepair, obviously, but get <laughs> antiquated such that kids in one facility just do not have the same opportunities that kids in another one do. And so when you see that, some of these, those big ticket numbers up there, those are what we refer to as 20 year renovations. Those are, those are buildings where sometimes the classrooms don't even fit current standards. Um, you know, a couple examples you'll see in the fine arts world coming up. We have some music rooms that were built when our fine arts programs were nowhere near what they are now. And our kids are playing music in rooms that just were not made for that, or not made for the number of kids that are in there. So um, those are just literally kind of gut that building and a new building really emerges uh, to give kids in those buildings the same kind of uh, facilities that others do. If you could try, we're going to have these little hourglasses and um, just, just so you know, you'll see some kitchen and stuff up there. We, you know, there are, there are big parts of our operation. We serve four million lunches a year, serve a million breakfasts a year. So, you know, while we're out there teaching algebra, we're also feeding kids quite a bit. So it's not a small piece of the operation. So. Um, so again, that's the largest portion, and you will see primarily upgrades, infrastructure renewal, renovation. That's, that's really what that is. Um, so let me get, um, I already used juggernaut, so I gotta figure another word. But we are a fine arts, give me another word anyway. Powerhouse, yeah, excellent. We are a fine arts, see there, uh, power, powerhouse. So let me get, tell you what I mean by that. If you click on the top one, uh, first of all, just by sheer numbers, uh, and I want you to remember this number. There's going to be a little audience participation in a minute. 18,000 kids are in our fine arts programs uh, by choice, right? Uh, they, they choose to be in fine arts because of the quality of those programs. 18,000 secondary kids, 6 through 12, in our fine arts. And we are the unrivaled leader there as well. Um, we just are. Uh, there's some pieces of data up there. Uh, we, we educate 1% of the kids in Texas, but we educate 6.3% of the all-state musicians. Have to earn that, right? The Texas Music Educators Association picks honor bands and choirs and, and orchestras every year to go down, a huge honor. We had three selected, which is almost unheard of to go down there this year. In visual arts, uh, we have a comparable thing in the state where ultimately through adjudication, 113 of the best visual art projects in Texas <laughs> came to be adjudicated uh, at the state level and Plano kids had 63 of them. So those are data that, that we, we think speak for themselves. By the way, we do have an Elite Eight debate team too at Plano Senior High School. They're, they're in the Elite Eight right now, just beat a school from California a couple weeks ago. In a week or so, they go to New York and compete against you know, the best in, in, in the world, really. Um, and so we were, in fact, recognized as being among the best communities in America for music education. So uh, we, you'll see within that, I mentioned in here, we do have some renovations. If you go into those rooms and watch the huge orchestras playing in these little rooms, you will know that those renovations really uh, need to occur. But you've, you've probably heard, uh, probably the biggest ticket item here is the Plano ISD Performing Arts Center. Uh, there was a lot of conversation uh, in, the, in the committee on this, and ultimately, um, let, me, let me share a few pieces of data. Those kids that, of those 18,000 performers, 70 times this year, they will go, their parents usually, uh, sometimes the school, but a lot of time their parents will go rent spaces because when they perform, there are more people who want to come watch them than we have room for in any of our auditoriums. So 70 times this year to the tune of what? I think it's about 50 grand or so, $45,000 we spend to go rent spaces. Now some of our orchestras, uh, we don't rent spaces, they play in the gym. 
because there is enough seating in the gym uh, for orchestra performances. Now, you can ask yourself, should orchestras be playing on the gym floor? Um, probably not. But let me, um, lest, because uh, we, we actually had somebody say, they're building this, uh, they want to build this performing <laughs> arts center. They, what are they going to be, the first in Texas? Well, no, they're all around. In fact, uh, one of the members on our committee it knows full well that our kids go to Allen quite a bit. Uh, because we don't have we don't have anything the UIL will sanction. To uh, Al's laughing, he was on our committee, right? And and w one gentleman who didn't say a lot the whole thing, but when this came out, he said he's tired of going Allen. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm sick of Allen. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I put these up there because um, you look at Bastrop; uh, they have 10,000 kids total, K to 12. Um, Texarkana, 7,000 total kids. Um, so the reality is, how many did I tell you we have in our fine arts programs at secondary level? 18,000. 18, so what you're, what you're seeing here are two districts that don't have 18,000 kids combined, pre-K to 12. And I can tell you that their fine arts programs can't even compare to ours. But the reality is when, do, when their kids do perform, they perform in these halls, while our kids rent space and play on gym floors. And that's really what ultimately the, the, the facilities task force said. We are in a position to change that now. And so let's do it. And that's really what it came down to. Uh, so you'll, you'll see pretty much those are, those are some of the, the improvements to the fine arts program as well. So this is the, the third biggest area. But it, it, truthfully, this is the one that probably has paid the heaviest price uh, for the uh, eight year stretch out. And the reason is, like I said, the chiller is going to be replaced. But you can defer uh, and live with the technology that you have. And, and certainly our teachers sometimes feel like they see colleagues in, in other districts that, that might have access to technologies that, that we don't have. Um, you know, the, a lot of this is just simply putting us on a five-year replacement cycle for our own workstations. But admittedly, there is some new in here. Uh, we feel like it, 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 um, it, not only with workstations, but there are technologies, whether it be 3D printers and other things that our kids really should be accessing in specialized programs. And we have them now. I don't want to say we don't, but we really could expand opportunities. Another big part of it, though, people don't realize, we'll click on this little hourglass, there's a huge backbone infrastructure. You know, we have 50,000 times a day kids and teachers and people get on, and they don't care, <laughs> you know, what's happening behind the scenes. They care a lot if it doesn't work, and, uh, but, but that's really what's going on. And so inherent in this bond package also is all the routers, switchers, bandwidth that, that makes sure that, that our kids have access to the 21st century technologies that we want to use uh, to make them be successful in the classroom. So uh, that's, that's the third uh, portion of it. Now this is one, um, you're going to see, uh, there was a lot of conversation in our bond committee about how do we give Plano ISD flexibility to address potential future needs, but at the same time not be foolhardy about it. We're talking about expanding classroom uh, capacity here, and you're going to see several times the words if needed. And let me tell you why that if needed is important, and it was really important for our facilities task force. I think two words that come to mind are uncertainty, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. And then credibility, and that's credibility for our, our board, for Steve, for, for Plano ISD. And the reason I say that is we're actually going to use uh, $16 million that existed uh, still from the 2008 bond package um, to meet needs primarily, get the portables off Plano East High School. We've had, we've had 16 portables that our kids are learning in for over a decade at Plano East. And that's just, the facilities task force said that's unacceptable. Our, our kids should not be in those as a long-term solution. But the reason those dollars are still there is because they were originally scheduled for a, a, to build a new elementary school in the east side of, of, of Plano. But the reality is that the enrollment tapered off. We did put an eight classroom addition at Hunt Elementary School, and basically that met the need. And so then we didn't build the new school just because you have the bond uh, uh, authorized. If you don't need it, you don't build it. 
And they felt that that really gave us a lot of credibility. They, they knew that we would make those kind of responsible decisions. And so they said, all right, let's make sure we don't come out of this thing and we didn't kind of look down the line with a visionary lens and see is there a potential to have an issue. So let me give you an example. If you could click on this one. You'll, you'll, if you look at our demographers report, we're scheduled to be somewhat stable in our enrollment over the next decade, might start climbing toward the end. Um, but there are areas in our, um, in our community, if you notice the list of, that was up there previously were schools that they did identify within the next decade are gonna be over capacity. So here's three of them. Uh, Aldridge, Mendenhall, and Stinson. And the problem is right here, we have potential for some real uh, significant growth, depending on how that development plays out. So when you have that kind of situation around it, and if that growth comes, what that means is to try to rezone where you do have capacity, you are moving a lot of kids through this zone to this zone to this zone. And so the, the, the facilities task force said, let's make sure there's some money in there. It could be that we just simply put a, a, an addition at Aldridge or we put an addition at Stinson or whatever it might be, depending on what shows up in the next five years. Does that make sense? All right, so let, let's go back to probably the bigger issue. If, and and uh, this is where I, I told you we, we were gonna show your neck of the woods, um, it, you know, it, we, we, um, we have a bigger challenge in our Northwest, and that's all of these schools. Th these schools are at capacity now. Um, we did move 100 students from Brinker to Hahn next year because Brinker's overcrowded today. Um, and so what that essentially does then is it really pretty much puts at capacity all of these elementary schools. And then you got a whole lot of stuff going on right up here. Um, so uh, this is this probably ate up the most capacity conversation in our facilities task force, and and said that's why they said include a new school. Quite frankly, um, that's why they said include a new school in this bond package. And if you don't need it, don't build it. And that's really what it comes down to. Okay. So it, 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 is, it is really a little more complicated because to rezone your way out of that problem we just showed is really potentially hundreds and thousands of kids. So, Would you have yeah. space on your Yeah, uh, part of that, if you go back, <laughs> part of that is, is land acquisition for new elementary schools where, where we don't have space, um, we find it, and, and we do have some land right now in certain areas. Um, Steve will divulge all, well, he won't divulge all the conversations that he's, that he's had, maybe. Um, so that's that piece of it. But then there's also program capacity, and there was some conversation about this. We are going to create a, a special education transition center, and, and what that amounts to is we do educate young people who are cognitively disabled, and we educate them by law from ages 18 to 21. And that really is about trying to help them become independent or semi-independent. We do that right now at every one of our senior high schools. Um, we can serve them much better by bringing them together in a transition center, put it near public transportation because that's a big deal, make sure that then the businesses that help support those young people and get them into the world of work have one place to go to to interface with. There's a theory and a practice part of it, but the reality is we need the space in our senior high schools. It would cost us this much money or more to just recover that much space at the senior high schools, and we will serve these young people much better than we can now. There is a third employee child care. We have two now. There is a waiting list uh, on that. It is a huge recruiting and retention tool for us. Um, some of those great <coughs> teachers I talked about, they stay because their kids can go into these centers. They pay the operating cost. This costs us no money. In fact, it makes a tiny bit of money. But we need to build a facility to add uh, that geographically. It would help us as well. Um, and then, um, you know, some additional academic initiatives that we have in there. But those are the things. Uh, another one that is an as needed. You might have seen, we got some great uh, 
uh, press uh, in, on the television. We are launching into a full day pre-K program for four-year-olds who come from economically disadvantaged uh, environments. Um, you know, some of our own data told us that when, we, when, when kids went just half day to our early childhood centers and they're economically disadvantaged and they have English language learner issues, three years later as third graders, they outperform peers who did not have that experience by over a half a standard deviation. So it, it really is a fairly big deal. Um, we are going to use existing capacity in five of our elementary schools. You know, we have those rooms. Um, and so we want to bring four-year-old, about 270 if we fill them all up, uh, four-year-olds who can begin uh, their learning and also then right in the environment there, they will go to kindergarten in. And it's, they're already filling up. Um, you know, I told a lot of people, the principal at Thomas <coughs> Elementary has been asking for this since 2007. I, I told people, you don't worry about Thomas, she will go get them. And in fact, Thomas is almost full uh, right out of the gate. Um, and so at our early childhood centers as well, we'll have a couple full day classrooms. But uh, the reality is, this is another AFNI if needed. We have a ton of impoverished kids in the southwest corner of our district. It's why Jackson and Huffman are two of the schools where we are going to bring five or four year olds into a couple classrooms. But the reality is, people said, well, what if they come in in huge numbers? If they do, we have land at Maple Shade. We have it right now. And if those numbers come in enormous and we can't serve them in the two schools where we have capacity, then we would consider building another early childhood center to meet the needs of kids in that corner of our, our community. So that's, that's the other if needed portion on this. We're not building it right now. We want to first see how many of our kids are, are coming in for that. Safety and security it pretty much speaks for itself. You know, it's about access point security. It's about communication. These are the things that, that, that we know um, we need. Um, buses, uh, the important point up here, you know, the industry standard says buses are on a 12 to 15 year life cycle. This bond is keeping us on a 15 year life cycle. So we're not on the front end, we're on the back end of that. Uh, but that's because we maintain them well. Watch our little video, it's six minutes. You will see Dominique, the most tremendous little elementary school kid, and she will tell you that our, our buses travel the distance from Plano to Tokyo and back every day, 14,000 miles. Have you seen it? Isn't she good? Yeah. She is out there, boy. Um, and, uh, and, and then she, every day, that's a lot of miles, she says, you know. Anyway. Um, I, I uh, and, and you know, of course, they're stopping and starting, so it's, a, it's pretty good that, that we make sure we, we have a fleet that is, is meeting their needs. Uh, finally, athletics, it's 2% of the overall bond package. When I say we had conversation, a lot of stuff, trust me, we had so much conversation. I know more about AstroTurf now than I ever <laughs> dreamed I would. Um, but what you do need to know is most of this is AstroTurf replaced, and the reality is you recover operating costs, about 50 some thousand dollars annually for a field. If you do put down that turf, you stop maintaining the natural. So we return about 400 grand to the operating fund by uh, putting that turf in, and we, we lim limit consolations and stuff like that. So that was some of the conversation. So this is it in its totality, that color wheel you see on your documents, that really aligns with you know, how proportionally these things play out. Um, we have had some people feel like you know, we struck a pretty good balance on, on where those dollars should be going uh, in this. And I think that's, that's probably the best work of that facilities task force. So you see it correctly in the bottom corner, current tax rate remains the same. We are the, right now currently the second lowest uh, school tax rate in Collin County. And uh, just in case people who view this didn't see that, I want to make sure uh, <laughs> the next slide uh, emphasizes that point. Um, but, but truly, th that, is, that is because we are in a good financial position right now. And it, and it really is, uh, I give credit to 
great uh, responsible decision making that's that's happened for many years and the fact that you know we when you stretch it out over eight years you you, you take cut down a lot of debt for our senior citizens uh, at, I just presented this at Williams the other night the good news it was a small crowd but the good news is one of them was the AARP uh, representative for uh, Plano and she took back tons of written resources and this was something that she wanted to make sure everybody understood and this is about being positioned for the future I mentioned um, the reality is even before we just refinanced 40 percent and Steve go like this yeah 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 um, we, we hit the market really well um, refinanced what 40 percent of our existing bond uh, ended up taking what four years of debt off the back end Steve which gives you the most debt reduction uh, 77 million dollars ultimately so we will have less debt five years from now than the very night the board voted to put this on the on the ballot so no tax rate increase and we'll actually have less debt at the end of it than we have right now and we've paid down what 250 million dollars of debt in the last three years so um, that, that's really why the, the facilities team felt like, we, you know what, we have positioned, you know, the next facilities task force, the next superintendent, I hope I'm still it, um, but, you know, board or whoever, community, uh, to be in a, in a great position five years from now. Um, so we do, uh, you've, a lot of you have been sent some of our, this information, that video. Um, we certainly want folks to be informed um, and, uh, <laughs> That's, that's when the early voting starts. I think most of you know that. Um, and then my slide questions, by the way, that's Lily Whistler. She is our elementary print, uh, teacher of the year. She teaches at Barron Elementary, 90.3% free and reduced lunch. And they outperform virtually every elementary school in Texas that's demographically similar to them. And they do that because they are full of people like her. She is amazing. So we we use it. we thought that was a pretty good slide for any questions must be this little girl's birthday i think because they, they usually put those kind of ears on them uh when it's their birthday but anyway um any questions about any of it go ahead sir uh being a real new resident to the city i always hear about the area being uh, pretty built out and there's quite a few things that has land acquisition there could you explain a little bit more about uh, are you selected for quite a few of these uh, yeah. features or, or is it still be selected? Yeah, some, some of both. Steve, can you explain that a little further? <laughs> yeah, he, as Dr. Bailey mentioned, we do own some land, uh, Maple Shade sites, uh, just east of Preston on Maple Shade. If you know where Christina's nursery is, it's the land behind it and west of it. Uh, we own a piece of land with, where the old uh, Texas A&M extension farm was there off Coy. Uh, that northwest corner is really a challenge. There's not a lot of available land there, so that, that's one that we'll be looking at if we needed something there. Uh, the area, uh, the Richardson area that was mentioned where State Farm is, is also a challenge to find any <coughs> remaining land there. Uh, the special ed transition center and the uh, boy child care center would be much smaller pieces of land in fact the <coughs> works possibly on the special ed transition center so we're actively looking at those and long story short we own a few pieces uh, but there are some other ones that we'll be actively looking for over the next couple of years you know knowing some of these realities <laughs> i mean steve's been having conversation for a long time in some of these areas about certain but you're you're right uh, okay, and then yeah. Neil, I so think. speaking of the northwest um, corner there, where we're going where we're gonna to have all that growth, how much lead time do we really need to kind of anticipate whether we're going to need a school there, and, and how much time does it take to actually put a facility in? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's generally two to three years, certainly. I mean, and and that's part of the issue. You know, the 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 facilities task force said, well, this is five year bond, but you really got to look eight years because. You may be in a position right toward the end of this where now you see numbers that say we got to get going um, and and so from architectural you know work to finished product is that pretty accurate yeah i think about three years the other uh one other point on that one of the there were so many different line items you know, 
Dr. Bingley would have gone through all of them would be here till 10 o'clock. But one of the ones on the attic capacity was $5 million uh, for adding classroom capacity. And so Gullage would be a school that we would potentially look at. The, uh, according to the demographer's numbers, uh, the move that we made a couple, or well, I guess one month ago, uh, where we moved some students from Brinker to Hahn, uh, according to his numbers, that should pretty much take care of Brinker and Hahn. Barksdale may be going down a little bit. Uh, Gullage is the one that looks like it would be over capacity somewhere in the next five years. If you're familiar with Gullage, it sits on a huge piece of land that includes Robinson and Jasper. Uh, and it would be a, a pretty easy one to add onto the back of to create. You know, if we had eight, eight classrooms, that takes care of about 175 more students. So it's something that we're keeping an eye on, the, the demographer's numbers, if, you know, if they're accurate. And on a total basis, he missed our total enrollment this year by 11 kids out of 55,000. So uh, when you break it down school by school, it gets a little more, you know, some of the sharp that some pencil. Little <laughs> yeah, that's a, 11, that's double digits. You know, I mean, get that into single numbers. And any, any, any honest demographer, and ours is honest, will tell you getting that big number close is a lot easier than getting the, the individual schools close. Uh, for one thing, you're having to estimate how many kindergartners are going to be there three years from now. Right. Who knows? So, uh, But we should be okay. We do have the extra. It would take about two and a half million dollars to add eight classrooms. And we have five million in there, so if we had to do that at a couple of schools, we could do that uh, by a little time instead of having to build a new. Yeah. And that becomes the issue. I mean, some school sites don't have that capacity. Right. You know, others do. Right. And so, yeah. I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments. I don't have a question. Folks, I'm a, I'm a fifth generation Texan, but I've worked in with superintendents in California, in Illinois, Virginia, unfortunately, Louisiana. <laughs> I went there for three years to pay back something I did in the past life. I don't know what it meant. But I took the opportunity a few days ago to read the bond issue here for Plano ISD. And it's not only responsible and forward looking, and the only thing I want to play my hand is I arrived here about the same time, you're moving faster than I'm able to move to Collin College, so God love you. But we're, we're strongly in support of the issue. You know, we're proud of our partnership with Plano ISD. Uh, so our largest campus is in Plano and Spring Creek. Uh, we're looking to expand that down the road to partner with further. But Brian, we uh, want to come out and make sure that you were highly supportive. Appreciate it. Well, you know, I, I don't want to take credit. You know, basically, when I got here, they said, look, we're moving this thing, so jump on board. You know, so I, I, I did. Um, um, yes? Hi. I want to commend you for everything you're doing. I think you're representing our city and our county uh, superbly. Um, the board did an excellent job choosing you, and so thank you for your work. Oh, thank you. Uh, your work is not easy, and it doesn't ever end. Uh, my question for you is, in regards to the congressman viewing education funding at the federal level, we are seeing a mass movement of educating students at an even younger and younger age. And so this idea of this pre-K center starting at the elementary schools, maybe building more, is um, wonderful. Are you seeing, though, that the children in our area are needing this pre-K education preschool in order to be able to start kindergarten or to be successful long term? And do all children need a pre-K environment, no matter what your socioeconomic level yeah. is? Yeah, um, I, 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 the first one is certainly yes. Um, it, it's about both pre-K readiness or K readiness, and then that readiness. You know, there's tons of research says you better deal with that early. A great study from Vanderbilt University said basically 75% of the variance of student performance all through the K-12 arena walks in the door at kindergarten. That's what that study showed. So it really kind of tells you. Now, the, the indictment was we're not very good at closing it because it's tough. <laughs> when, you get, when those kids get further down the line, it is really harder to move that needle. When, and you, you hear about summer slide. They get further and further behind. Um, so it, it really is both of those things. I invite any one of you, especially if you're having a bad day, <laughs> you know, go through the security stuff, but um, you watch what happens at our early child care center. They are having a blast. They got the big t-shirts on, they're learning, because you know, when they make a mess. Um, and they're getting ready to be successful. Just as successful, my daughter was read to every night. 
we've got children that, for whom that's not the case. And they come now with a readiness ability at five-year-old kindergarten that they wouldn't otherwise have. Our most recent data were 30% for introduced lunch as of two days ago. Many old-time Planoites would say that can't be so, but that is so. And so um, we want to get in front of that to help those children have the same chance that all other children have um, as they move forward. And, and, and again, if you can do it, we like the model on our elementary schools. They're, they're going to go to kindergarten right there. Um, they'll be off and running. When they come from air, you know, situations of poverty, and also English language learner issues. Um, you know, we had a great, uh, Toyota gave us a, a help family literacy grant. Many of you were there at, at our family literacy program. And that's a program where we're, we're helping the whole family try to make sure we, we close those gaps before kids start. And um, there's pretty clear evidence that, that young people living in poverty, they are just coming to kindergarten with less readiness than their more affluent peers, and that's a reality. And it's a very, fast race to try to make that difference. And then when they go away for the summer, they slide back again. So the idea is the earlier you can infuse that effort, the, the more bang for the buck you have. I, I don't think anybody denies that that's true. Um, the question is how pervasive you make it. And um, my child had a pre-K experience because I gave it to her. That's a decision we made um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but, I, you know, we could have kept her at home and, and continue to try to support her as well. Well, um, Jamie, you've already sent all of our information and stuff. And so, I mean, we just really ask folks if you know, and by the way, if you have another group that you say, hey, Brian, you know, you know, we can do this in 10 minutes, we can do it in 20, we can do whatever. If you have a group and you say, hey, Brian, can you come on out and share? I will be glad to do, we will come anywhere. But the information that we've provided, if you can send little Dominique's video, uh, not our video, it's hers, um, and uh, it really, all of that provides information that we think is important. We can live with the will of the people as long as we feel like we've done what we can to make sure that they know what is and what isn't. Okay, so I truly thank you for coming here and, and learning that part of it. about the needs of the business community, I applaud you and the committee as well, just really trying to make sure it fits the needs of those, uh, the workforce development that's coming here. I mean, we have 18,000 jobs going in on one corner, on the northwest corner there at the tollway. Um, how do we make sure those kids are ready? Um, another interesting fact, um, Toyota's workforce, 10% of them either have children or adults with special needs. You take their 4,000, that's 400 kids or adults with special needs. Um, sure, they're not all going to live in Plano, but, but it's nice to know that, that um, that's being planned for and being recognized that that's a growing need and that helps our business community.